Spurge here to introduce the upcoming episode of High Side, Low Side that you are about to witness. Uh, there was a bit of an internet connection issue, so the video is a bit laggy at times for about the first 20 minutes or so. We did resolve the issue for the second half of the podcast, but the audio is crystal clear. So you should have no problem hearing the shenanigans that Zach Kortz and I are about to present. So without any further ado, enjoy the newest episode of High Side, Low Side. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of High Side, Low Side. My name is Zach Quartz. That is Spurgeon Dunbar. And as much as everyone hates to admit it, we are in charge around here. <laughs> Today's topic is mechanic or DIY, Spurge. Yeah. So we're going to have Ari Henning on as our guest, and we're going to go through a couple of scenarios where we've made uh, embarrassing mistakes and blunders along the way. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about when it's appropriate to admit that you probably shouldn't do it yourself and maybe you take it to the mechanic. And we've got a couple little surprises in store. And as always, we've got some viewer questions at the end. But before we get into it, let's get into word from our sponsor. All right, so we're going to run through a whole different slew of uh, DIY mechanic uh, mishaps and uh, just conversational fun in general. But before we do so, um, I wanted you to notice that I am not in the studio right now, Mr. Quartz. I, I did notice that, actually. This yeah. is sometimes where this is uh, this is the Joe Zito penalty box. I thought, <laughs> just like you shove him in there when he's been bad. Yeah, so we have another production actually happening in the studio right now. So this is ah. actually an executive's office here at Revzilla. This is Mark Brer's office. And Mark <laughs> said that we could use his office to shoot in as long as we showcase some of the art. So Mark is a big Pink Floyd fan, and he wanted us to oh, show wow. uh, some of the Pink Floyd art that he has all around the office. This is one that I stole from behind his desk. Just so there you go, Mark. <laughs> Everybody in the world knows that you are now the biggest Pink Floyd fan. <laughs> and for those of you listening and not watching, it's a triangle and a rainbow, and <laughs> you probably, you get it, Pink Floyd. But it's actually a nice, a nice looking piece of art. Um, yeah, so Mechanic and DIY, um, we, it's very appropriate. We're going to have Ari Henning on the program because he is the sort of the, the ultimate DIY guy. And I'm actually curious to pick his brain about um, things that he would recommend uh, you do yourself, which is just about everything. Did you know, for example, that he shaves his own face? Really? Uh, yeah, he doesn't, he uh, doesn't, because I, I know knew? that you go who to a knew? barber and you get that beard professionally groomed <laughs> once a month. Oh my God. I never, it, I don't even groom it. It's just, it's on the loose. Um, but yeah, jokes aside, uh, I'm interested to hear what Ari has to say about um, when he would recommend you take a bike to a mechanic because he basically I, never does that. So I'm, I'm interested to hear what he says. I think it'll be fun to see what his <laughs> threshold is to take it to a mechanic before yeah, what exactly. our threshold is to take it to a mechanic. Because I, I have a feeling the, the barrier to entry there is going to be a little bit different. So we're going to jump right in with Ari. But before we do so, make sure you are subscribing on Apple iTunes to keep up with all of... Actually, you can subscribe wherever you want. The podcast comes out all over the place. But if you're going to leave a review for us, make sure you leave us a review on Apple iTunes. It helps us out. And to encourage you to do so, we are giving away t-shirts to one select winner an episode and zach who is our winner today yeah so the reason that spurge threw to me for this just so everyone knows is that there is no way to actually pronounce this person's name it's just <laughs> like it looks like they um sneezed uh when they were trying to type their name and they just mashed the keyboard and a whole bunch of letters came out try it uh, for so, try it for us zach how would you pronounce uh h-d-f-v-y-f-f -F? how would you pronounce that I think I would pronounce it. There you go. So it's two. You've won the. Uh, <laughs> you've won the T-shirt, uh, and uh, you've won for what we think is a pretty good reason, which is a, a very creative way to get a T-shirt. Um, the review consists of the words "Great podcast," "The best podcast on iTunes," "A must listen." Make sure you catch it on YouTube. Zach and Spurge are hilarious. But between all of those little phrases, we're little t-shirt emojis. And, yeah. you know, we're just, we're suckers for a clever response, I suppose. Yeah. So it has nothing to do with all the flattering comments about how <laughs> no. good we are. It's all about the fact that you had a bunch of t-shirt emojis in there and we thought that was damn creative. Yep. Exactly. Pretty ridiculous. So, um, but we do appreciate your your uh, review, <laughs> and we hope that uh, you actually enjoy the podcast and you didn't just try to butter us up to get a t-shirt. But if you did, you know what? It worked. And so all you have to do now, so the, the other part of this is that you don't just, we don't just magically know where you're ah, writing true, in from. True, Shoot yes. us an email to highside, lowside at revzilla.com and claim your free t-shirt and we will get it shipped out for you. So there you it's go. It's as easy as that everybody and uh you know if your name is not and you would just like to email us at highsidelowside.com you're welcome to do that as well we, we'd love to hear from you and that's where we pick um, out some of our comments that we show at the end of the show we got a bunch of great comments actually from emails that were written in to uh to us this week 
True enough. Okay, well, that's enough uh, t-shirt given away and enough hype around Ari Henning. Let's get that baby face in here. Hey, oh, there he is, Ari Henning, right on time, just like always. <laughs> Actually, while we're on the topic of right on time, I was late to this meeting. I'll raise my hand and say that. I apologize. I was wondering why I was waiting. Uh, yeah, that was my bad. I thought I could uh, squeeze in a daily rider before this recording. I uh, underestimated uh, the amount of time that that takes. So I'm raising my hand. You know, Sorry, I guys. think between this and the Daily Rider on the uh, the Street Triple R, where you had to put the little note in there about how we're docking you, we're docking you some some points for that one too. You know, I'm slipping. I know, I'm slipping a little bit, huh? I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> more to the point, Ari, you, I feel like you're always ready to talk about DIY, but are you especially ready today? I mean, you know, I've kind of made a career of that, so I'm, you have? I'm ready. Yeah. Well, I would say always. even you know the last time that we had you on the podcast, um, two episodes ago now, one of the things that we had talked about was the fact that you know you didn't like the fact that motorcycles were becoming too complicated because they were harder to work on yourself. So I mean, you know, in addition to all of the other reasons that you're perfect for this episode, we figured that was a great segue into really diving into a whole episode on DIY apparel or not apparel, but DIY mechanic stuff. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what we want to do to kick this thing off. Um, break the ice a little bit uh, with the audience. And also, I'm curious what story you have come prepared with, Ari. We want to talk about a, a personal blunder that, that oh. each one of us has made in trying to do something ourselves to a motorcycle. So do you have a, uh, you have a story that comes to mind? A time when you scrooged up? Several, actually. I mean, I think that's probably, <laughs> that's probably an important point to make, right? Is, is mistakes happen. It's going to happen. But my, my um, founding error was pretty grave actually i was trying to set the valve clearances on a, a motorcycle that i was um working on in my dad's basement and it was the first time i'd done valve clearances and i recognized that i needed to get a cylinder at top dead center and i decided to hang a screwdriver into the spark plug hole and watch it rise and i figured out oh, when it rises to the top and then starts to go back down i'll just back <laughs> the crank back a little bit that'll be top dead center perfectly fine to do with something like a straw or a zip tie or a pencil, not something good to do with a flat bed metal screwdriver. And Ugh. as I encountered a little bit of force trying to turn the engine over, I, you know, applied more because that's generally what you do when things are difficult, right? Oh. And proceeded to <laughs> scrape the entire stroke of that VT 500's front cylinder with the edge of my dad's flat blade screwdriver. So my valve clearance check quickly escalated into learning how to replace the cylinder on a VT500 as well. So explain, to, so explain why, no, like why did this not work? So I'm assuming you thought you would put it into the, the spark plug hole and you know, you're not putting any pressure on it. So it would just push the, the flathead screwdriver back up. Why, Correct. why did, why did, why did that not work? It did not work because of the angle of the spark plug, like rest the, the angle of the spark plug hole made it so that the, the screwdriver rested against the edge of the cylinder on mm -hmm. top of the piston. And, obviously you don't want to use a metal object like that was foolish i was i was younger i learned the lesson <laughs> the hard way which is often the best way to learn lessons but if you were to do it again if i were to do it again i would use a, a pencil or a, like a straw or something that obviously can't damage any of those internal engine parts but so yeah it was pretty while embarrassing we're, while we're on the subject um do you is that is that a technique that you would that you would recommend, like using a pencil or like some like a piece of to, to tell when you're at top dead center. Is that I don't, like, is that a reasonable? I don't thing even to do? know why I use that technique because all, <laughs> all all rotors on the side of the engine have timing marks on them, and there's a yeah. T for top dead center, and there's a little scribe on the rotor, and you line those two suckers up, and you're at top dead center. So I genuinely don't know. It probably I probably just didn't read the manual, which obviously is my number one piece of advice to anyone trying to DIY. <laughs> So for those of you out there listening, if you're trying to find top dead center, don't, I, I, just so we're clear, we're not sticking screwdrivers down spark plug holes and just cranking away until it pops out. It's not a good technique. I've tested it myself. I would not recommend it. Um, All right. Well, that sounds, right, you, that sounds like a good one to just chalk up for the, uh, the old, uh, no, do as <laughs> yeah. I say, not as I do, you know, what, um, what about you, Spurge? So uh, mine was the first time that I rebuilt uh, a set of forks um, on my Triumph Bonneville. I uh, basically took the tops off, um, drained all the fluid, and then went to take the plugs out of the bottom, which disassembles uh, the whole internal. And when you do that, there's no pressure on the system, which means that little bolt just completely spins. So short of putting everything back together, uh, which I did, and then by that point, it was already just loose, so it just continued to spin. 
So I spent about probably a good eight hours solid and then still oh couldn't God. disassemble everything. And I was, uh, I was lucky enough that I took it down to the local Triumph shop and there was a guy there that was like, listen, I have an impact gun that's going to get this out there for you. Just, and they didn't charge me anything. They popped the bolts out um, and I was able to finish the job myself. Um, but it was definitely one of those ones where to Aries point, I had the, the owner's manual or I had the, the shop manual. I had the whole service manual and I didn't, I just got ahead of myself. I was like, Oh, I'm just going to start taking stuff apart. Uh, and I'll look at the shop manual when I'm putting it back together. And if I would have read the instructions, I should have taken that little bolt out of the bottom while there was pressure on the whole system. Yeah. Yep. So, well, they still make that mistake version. So, <laughs> I mean, is, the, the, um, the worst the worst thing that came of this was I got I got fork oil all over the inside of my car because I just basically threw it in the back of the car and then oh. drove it down the dealership. So, oh, yep. either way, uh, that, if, as far as like worst things that could happen, that wasn't too bad. Um, this actually reminds me of a piece of advice that you always give me, Ari, which is if you like, not only should you read the manual, but read the process all the way through Correct. so that you understand what you have to do. And I hate that so much. It feels like <laughs> such a waste of time, but it's obviously the right thing to do. So. Yeah, I mean, how many how many transatlantic flights have we been on where I've sat next to you reading a Haynes manual? <laughs> many, <laughs> that's many, usually... many a flight. Um, well, but I think my... I think some of I think some of that's fun though, right? Like I think that like there is definitely something fun for looking at a manual, and like even if you don't ever plan on doing it yourself, like there is something cool about like looking at the step by step process to see how something gets taken apart or put back together if you don't know how to do it. Yeah, and most Certainly. of it's applicable to other bikes. Just because it's a manual for a Triumph Bonneville doesn't mean that same fork disassembly isn't going to work for a Honda or a Yamaha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, true now we, we we turn the question to you, Mister Quartz. What yeah. is your uh -huh. what is your blunder that you want to share with the audience today? I don't, I don't know if I I don't know if I've heard of a story from Zach about. Oh wait, I know of a couple actually. Yeah, I, was I, was say, <laughs> I hope this has to do with a battery. Uh, no, I wasn't. I wasn't good. I, I mean, I can I can use that one. I think maybe we should have Ari tell that story after I tell this story because mine's mm. very simple. And um, I I, uh, I kind of figured that uh, I think Ari's anecdote about the cylinder and like gouging the whole cylinder is kind of like you know hilarious in retrospect and and just so kind of like cringeworthy and such a such a. Uh, an unfortunate mistake to make. I, one thing I did want to point out about that is that I do think it's interesting that that um, one thing that we th I think will be an ongoing theme about this is that sometimes when you make a mistake, it means you have to do more work. It means that you make oh, yes. more work for yourself. Almost and always. As long as you are, if you have that in the back of your mind that that might happen yep. and you're not just wildly frustrated with it, it can, it can, it can really broaden your your technical abilities soon or yeah. sooner, I think. There's a, there's a, I want to let you get to your anecdote, but there's a certain zen that comes with becoming a mechanic where am I allowed to say shit? whatever you'll bleep it out if I can't where, <laughs> where shit goes wrong and you just you come early on you get really frustrated you get really mad you want to throw a wrench you want to punch the wall but you get to a point in your mechanical career where something goes wrong like a connecting rod breaks in an engine and all you can do is be like well now I know like I know what needs to happen now and you just yep. you become very accepting of the situation I think that's certainly <laughs> a hurdle for a lot of people to to begin with is when things go wrong, they just lose self-confidence, they get upset, and you do get to a point eventually when things have gone wrong lo long enough or often enough that you just accept what is going on and proceed with how to fix it. But I right? think that's one of, that's, that's a really good note and something that I've, I've talked to a lot of people. If you're comfortable with the fact, like if something's already broke, it's already broken, right? Yeah. Um, now you can make it worse, but, but I, I think that if you're okay with going through that process, it can all be fixed. Now it might take more time or it might cost more money down the road if you really make it worse. But like, that's the beautiful thing about machines. They can almost always be repaired. Pretty much. Yeah. But yeah, true enough. back to Zachary here. Come on. What's yes. your, what's your, so what's my, your story? My blunder that I was gonna, uh, that I was gonna start with is very, very simple. Um, and I think I just wanted to, I don't know. I want to, I want to raise my hand and say that like, even, you know, w yeah, simple mistakes are easy to make. I was changing um, a sprocket on an XR250 when I was probably 15 or something. I don't know. Um, uh, sprockets were all cached. So front, I had to take front or, front or rear sprocket? Rear sprocket. Thank you. Should have clarified. So I had the rear wheel off. It was it was on like, you know, two five-gallon buckets um, as, as was the technology in my dad's shop. And I was trying to get the, the nuts loose that hold the... Uh, to hold the sprocket to the hub to, to the carrier right um and they were really tight and it was really hard and i was pulling really hard on the wrench and my hand slipped off and can you guess what i punched really hard with my knuckle the sprocket even with yes even while pulling though because that's that's a wise piece of advice when applying a lot of force in the shop is you should always pull instead of push this is you're less likely is, to punch things this is this is actually a great point perhaps i was not 
pulling and that was part of the problem but <laughs> whenever, i whenever abs- applying great force with a lever you pull instead of push because if and when it slips all you do is hit yourself as opposed to slipping and punching an engine case or you know a sprocket or a sprocket well that's exactly what i did i just absolutely blasted my knuckle open on this sprocket uh, i still have the scar yep. uh, to remind myself to um I, I suppose it should remind me to pull not push but of course it doesn't because i'm not smart enough but anyway the point is that's it's just such a simple mistake so simple. to make just like cover like pull don't push cover the sprocket with a rag so that you can't cut yourself on it stuff like that um so yeah anyway and if you would like to tell the better battery i want to battery, hear the battery I'm story <laughs> so yeah let's like I, i'm, I'm, I mean, I'm so i'm sorry you bled in your youth but i i want to hear what the battery story is do you want me to tell the story zach uh, yeah i do i think you're better you're the, you're the right one to tell. well i'm not and the problem is i don't necessarily remember the details i know it started with using a key as a screwdriver but is that did that uh, lead to the battery issue it was, it no, was the same bike it was the same bike no i don't i think we were just changing we were, we were we were trying to hook up a battery connector to power a GoPro for mm. uh, a shoot. So we, we were, had the bat- we had to hook up battery contacts. What bike? Correct. Let's so let's start with the bike for the audience. Yes. What bike are we talking well, about? Well, that's, that's a little bit of a touchy subject. <laughs> it's a, it was some, a Ducati been, scrambler. It was a Ducati <laughs> scrambler. There was some bad blood after that. Anyway, my dear friend Zachary here mistakenly uh, went for the positive terminal of the battery first, which many of us have done and scared ourselves with a spark. However, when Zach did it. I believe he dropped the wrench, which remained attached to the negative terminal and was arced against the frame. And, uh, you know, when it's transmitting whatever, 100 amps or 150 amps, it gets red hot real fast and it caught on fire. <laughs> so basically it, we, we had to rush over and I think we used a t-shirt, right? To try and slap the wrench away. Yeah. Well, we basically, yeah, it got, it got red hot and it welded the wrench to, uh, either to the frame or to the bolt, to the yep. screw. And then the bike essentially caught on fire. Um, Didn't and, essentially it did it was on fire yeah it was actually it was on fire <laughs> it burned it burned the wiring harness in a big way it did uh and yeah we used a t-shirt to put out the fire and uh <laughs> i learned a very valuable lesson about disconnecting the battery terminal first negative and, terminal comes off first and goes back first or so goes back so last. just so just so we're clear so, so i'm trying to paint this picture for the audience you had a battery that was connected to the motorcycle the black negative terminal was still connected to the battery you then took the wrench and disconnected the uh the red positive terminal and while you were doing that the the wrench that you were using uh touched a a metal part on the bike correct the ground yeah so the black is the black is grounded to the chassis and if the red touches anything grounded at any point it conducts electricity so there's a note for all of you out there in the audience that maybe you're you're just learning how to work on bikes, um, and this is something that applies to cars too. So if you're ever changing the battery in your <laughs> automobile, uh, you always want to start by removing the negative black wire to the battery before you start any job. That is a and, PSA. And I don't um, I don't remember the specifics of that exact situation, but I will say it is an easy mistake. It can be an easy mistake to make it on a motorcycle in so much as um, the battery is often underneath the seat on a motorcycle and there's sort of a tray under there between the frame spars. And you can easily think like, oh, I'll just put the screwdriver or the wrench or whatever over here. And then if you bump it or you or something happens and it slips, it just trickles down to the base of that yeah, little pan. It literally, like gravity pulls it toward the battery. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Well, lots of, lots of mistakes we've covered there, and obviously we have <laughs> yes, learned lessons from each of them, and hopefully the people listening will also learn without having to suffer the way we have. <laughs> so then let's move on. Let's move on to, uh, you know, obviously we've made mistakes in learning how to do it ourselves, um, but I think everyone here is, you know, at least experienced to the point where we've tried doing uh, you know, even even jobs where we have never tackled them before, you know, we've sat down and we've tried doing it. So I, I want to start off with, with Ari again on this one. But Ari, where would you recommend someone to start, right? If, if somebody out there is listening and, you know, they want to do it themselves, what would you recommend as a starting point for that? The starting point is always research. Like diving in blind, thinking you'll figure it out as you go is a recipe for disaster. And the (laughs) the best way to success is to be prepared. So whether that's reading a shop manual or doing research on YouTube and watching someone do the same procedure you're trying to do on the same bike, uh, it is, I I don't like to leave any stone unturned when it comes to doing something. Obviously, if you're breaking into an engine, you never know what you're going to find, but you shouldn't dive into an engine not knowing what the steps are and not knowing what the parts are you're going to encounter and what the special tools are that you might need. Because again, that's just setting yourself up for failure and frustration, which is what I think turns a lot of people off of DIY is they have one mishap, one misstep, one expensive mistake, and then they never want to do it again because they don't trust themselves. And you can eliminate that lack of self-confidence by building confidence by doing the research ahead of time. 
So exercising your brain is what you would recommend as a starting point. <laughs> Sometimes you have to read words in a book. <laughs> <laughs> what's funny is that there was a bit of a there was a bit of a screen lag while you said that so it came out really slow motion like your words Blah. were normal speed but like your your mouth was like you have to read books. well that's good let's <laughs> drive that point home i mean that's the salient <laughs> point there's a, there's a reason we named the uh the diy show that we do on the revzilla youtube channel the shop manual it's uh it's deeply rooted in my brain <laughs> well, I think it goes back to, you know, the, the comment you made earlier about like reading stuff for fun on planes, because I know, you know, when I first started doing this, there's a bunch of really great just general repair manuals out there that are not necessarily bike specific. And I used to just read them because I, I didn't, you know, when I was first starting off, I, I, I didn't know. And I had a background in working on cars. But when you start to transfer that that knowledge over to, to motorcycles, you know, there is some specific points where, you know, you're, you're learning different things, you know, compared to, you know, working on a car. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So I want to now pivot to Mr. Quartz. So Mr. Mr. Quartz, what would your starting point recommendation be for a, a do-it-yourself yeah, project? Yeah, and I think um, this is uh, obviously, yeah, Aries' answer of research is a is a good one. And I think it sort of alludes to the fact that it's different for every person, right? Like you, you, it, you can't just say like, well, you should definitely do an oil change at home and you should definitely have valves checked by a mechanic um, because some people are ready to check their valves and do that. And other people are just not, and they might even not be ready to change their own oil yet. Um, but I do think, yeah. So I think like, you know, running yourself up to that and, and, you know, preparing yourself. I, I do think we're going to talk about um, kind of mechanical misconceptions later on in the show, just as a spoiler alert. But I do think um, there are a couple things that come to mind for me that are actually pretty easy to do that I think people think are really hard. Um, so I just kind of wanted to take this moment to say, uh, you know, oil change is one, um, uh, you know, uh, changing a tire, looping a chain, that stuff's pretty basic. The one that always sticks in my mind is changing brake pads, which we've talked about before. Um, especially if it's on a sort of modern bike that has, um, you know, uh, disc, disc brakes and, and relatively easy access to the calipers. It's just a remarkably easy thing to do. Really. They, they come apart pretty easily. Um, as long as you're diligent with, um, with putting every, taking everything apart and putting everything back together. There are very few pieces uh, and it's a satisfying upgrade or, or, or repair even to make to your bike. And it's just so, so easy. Yeah, that's true. It is obviously very important to ensure that everything is properly torqued when you put it back yeah. since your brakes are so important and that new brake pads need to be bedded in. They can't, they're not just going to be good to go right off the, right off the bat. They're just like tires. You got to give them a couple hundred miles of gradually stronger use to bed them in. So they, they, they match to the surface of the rotor. Yeah, I, I definitely, it's funny because, you know, Zach, Zach alluded to, you know, one of the upcoming questions about misconceptions and he, he stole my answer uh, for that section, which was going to be break pad. <laughs> so I'll have to come up with another one in my head. Um, but no, I, I think that, you know, people, you know, and, and I noticed this because before I ever worked on, on motorcycles, I, when I was in college, I worked as an auto mechanic and there were a lot of people that were afraid of, of doing their own brakes. And, and that's why we got a lot of um, work out of it. But, you know, modern brake pads um not you know having to take a drum apart and putting new shoes oh, on yeah. which can get complicated at times especially if something goes wrong but really for for modern brake pads it is a, a pretty easy job as long as you you know like Ari said then proceed to uh ride correctly for the first couple hundred miles mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so is that the uh, is the that one, the number that you would that's the number that you threw out there a couple hundred miles i, I honestly would have said less I mean, that's Just what the manufacturers say. I've, yeah, I've had insider info from people at EBC and Galfer who are like, you can knock it out in three laps at the track. But that also <laughs> requires uh, proper rotor prep, right? Like yes. on the street, 300 miles, if you don't do anything to your rotors, if you are able to glass bead blast your rotors or at minimum clean them with uh, like Scotch-Brite and brake cleaner, that will remove the old glazing and, and help accelerate the, the bedding in process. Yep. So that's actually a good tip. So for any of you out there that feel like you have rotor warp, before you spend a lot of money changing your rotors, if you use uh, Scotch Bright or you know like a three M pad and just yep. spin your wheel and just really give those those rotors a, a nice little uh, scuffing, that can usually uh, solve your problem without having to spend a bunch of money on replacing your rotors. Yeah, that's a great tip because it only takes a, a couple thousandths of an inch of buildup to create that pulsing at the finger. And people are like, oh, I've, I've warped my rotors. And you're like, man, they're like four and a half millimeters thick steel. Like, they, don't, they don't warp very easily. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, so um, uh, I, I, I want to I throw out one last uh, DIY thing for, for my end before we move on to, you know, the next topic here. But so, Zach, you kind of hit on this in passing. And you know, I wasn't I wasn't going to take, you know, cleaning and lubing your motorcycle chain because I figured Mr. Ari Henning was going to do that one. Um, so that's <laughs> not what I what I picked for my answer. Um, 
But I pick tire maintenance, right? And, and here's why. I think there are a lot of people out there that have no idea how to change a tire or even how to plug a tire, um, let alone if there's a tube in it and how to do all that. And one of the biggest things that you'll run into at least once in your motorcycling career is you're probably going to get a flat. And it's probably going to be somewhere that is inappropriate or it's an inappropriate <laughs> time of day. And there's not yep. an easy place to just get a mechanic or take it to a shop. So I would highly recommend anyone out there listening to this, you know, even if you let your chain rust fast, um, lo- <laughs> look at him. He's crying. He's crying. He's got heart it tastes like pennies in his mouth. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> but I think I think you should take take the time to practice at home, right? Get if if your tires are, are getting due for a change, pull the tire off, pull the wheel off the bike. You know, practice plugging a tire, um, practice changing a tube if you have tubes in your tires. I think it's something that if you can learn how to do it in your garage, it's a lot easier to do it there than on the side of the road. 100%. Is there hundred percent? Is there a is there a shop manual episode about how to do that, Ari? I don't remember. There is a shot manual episode, and I think I did an article on Common Tread about it as well. So yes, lots of information. Lots of information go. from the Ari Henning on Common Tread or um, on the shop manual on YouTube. So you know, we'll plug there. See what I did. Um, so <laughs> I. Um, well done, Zach. Thank you. I want to throw one more question to you in this category, Ari, which is, um, you know, we're sort of talking about like things we're encouraging people to do. What What do you think? What do you think is the the an item that comes to the top of your mind that is something that's very expensive to take to 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 get done at a shop, but someone can do relatively easy at home, like a, a, a something that represents that ratio in kind of a a wide way. I think the 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 biggest delta you're going to find is honestly on the routine simple maintenance stuff that we've already mentioned. Whether it's changing your own oil, that where a mm-hmm. shop is going to charge you between a hundred and two hundred dollars. And you can do it at home for the cost of oil and maybe forty dollars in supplies in twenty minutes. Um, yep. Brakes, like you said, bleeding the brakes. Uh, yeah. Air filter, any sort of basic service. It's just kind of you know shop shops charge an hourly rate of between at minimum seventy five dollars, and here in LA, as much as one hundred and seventy five dollars an hour to work on your bike, and that is to work on your bike. That is to work on your bike. One hundred and seventy five dollars an hour Correct. is the going rate. At, I said at the upper end, so okay. up to that. So that is whether they are cleaning your chain, which anyone with a rag and a can of cleaner can do, or <laughs> they're setting the clearances on your desmodromic valves. Like it doesn't matter. That's what the shop charges. So certainly right. anything on that regular, um, regular maintenance schedule, I would strongly encourage people to do themselves and they will save hundreds, if not thousands of dollars over the course of the average year of riding. And for right. all of those of you out there listening, don't make Aerie cry. Don't let your chain get rusty. I was just <laughs> joking. Just clean and lube your chain regularly. You'll make him happy. That's yeah. right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yep. It's uh, the, the fact of the matter is that the whole chain thing, like a modern sealed chain, you can pretty much ignore it if you really want to. And what? It's going gonna, gonna to still last thousands and thousands of miles. It is the beauty of O-rings and sealed grease inside. I'm, I'm sitting here trying to throw the audience back in the right direction of maintaining their <laughs> chain, and you're going to turn around and say, just let it rust? Truth, my God, truth. man. Truth is more important than my own personal theology, Spurgeon. <laughs> yeah, wow, I'm still. Well you know, I want to. I want to move on, but I. I am actually. I'm actually interested to hear how your testing uh, is going with that BMW chain uh, that you I'm got a hold of. Done jack with it because you won't give me a month off work to ride twenty thousand miles. Come on, man. <laughs> I think if you're not pulling twenty thousand miles in a few weekends for fun, you're doing motorcycling all wrong. I haven't oh, figured. Boy. So yeah, BMW has this M endurance chain that they claim lasts as long as a regular chain, but with no maintenance. So you never have to lube it. You never have to adjust it. And that's all because of a coating they've put on it. And I got one from BMW and lo and behold, it looks like a chain. But what I would like to do is put it on a motorcycle (laughs) and basically ride it until it begins to act up, till it begins to wear out and fail and then be able to report on it. So unless I'm able to do that, I don't see any accurate and authentic way of of evaluating it. I don't don't want to just ride on it for 5,000 miles and be like, yeah, it's still fine because even a cheap $100 chain would still be fine. So yeah. if there's any listeners yeah, out there that are possibly retired or you just have a, a, a <laughs> flux of money and you're doing nothing but riding around on your motorcycle for 20,000 miles at a stretch, uh, shoot us an email and uh, we'll send you the chain. We'll throw it on your bike and then we'll uh, have you report back to Ari directly. Yeah, it is a 525. So make sure your bike takes that size. <laughs> um, well, on the topic of paying $120 an hour or whatever for mechanics to do work, occasionally that's the right decision. I have I have paid hundreds and hundreds of dollars to have um, my motorcycle serviced, um, 
it was like the last major thing I did, I think was like, um, uh, fork rebuild and like a full factory checkup and valves and, uh, you know, valve check, all that kind of thing. Um, cause that's like a little bit more than I, uh, was ready for. And I feel like we can all at some point, um, raise our hand and say, yeah, that's not, I'm not really interested in doing that. And it probably depends on the bike and the situation. But as we said, Spurge, I'm, I'm especially interested in where Aries is going to draw the line here of where you should take a bike to a mechanic. Well, I want to start by saying, wait, 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 I'm sorry. Before we get jump into this, speaking of paying (laughs) hundreds and hundreds of dollars, we need to go to an ad for Motul. So (laughs) quick time out and we'll be right back with you. All right. So we took a quick break. uh, And while we were actually, it wasn't that quick. I'd say for us, we were probably out here for about 30 minutes trying to figure this out, but hopefully uh, (laughs) we solved an issue that is now going to give you better visuals uh, for the remainder of those of you watching this on YouTube. If you've been listening on the podcast, nothing should sound different. It should still be crystal clear audio coming through your, uh, your ears. If you're, if you're listening on the podcast, forget this ever happened. And if you're (laughs) suffering through looking at our faces, then suffer suffer more then we're <laughs> sorry tools. um what were we talking about we were talking about um what was that we were about to jump you, into something you, you were talking about the last major service you did and deciding that you were going to pay to have it done and i was going to say that that is <laughs> that is a very important piece of self-awareness and humility that i think some people struggle with as well they are either okay underconfident and don't want to do anything or sometimes people are overconfident and there's no shame in being like hey i don't know what i'm doing here I'm going to pay someone who does. That is a perfectly <laughs> acceptable solution. Well, I can only think of um, I can only think of one specific example of you talking about a motorcycle and basically saying like, "Yeah, f- that noise. I'm not working on that. I'm just like going to have a tech do that. Like, no way am I touching that." Um, but again, I again, I'm curious um, where you where you would say you draw the line where you just say like, "Yeah, take it to a shop." What what? What motorcycle was that? What what did you draw the do, line on with that? Do you remember, Eric? Can you think of a bike? Uh, I'll give you a hint that you love that you just would wa- want to have nothing to do with adjusting the valves. Mm, I think it was probably an RSV4. Yes, it was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th- there's a reason I don't actually own one of those motorcycles, and it's because I don't want to. Well, number one, they're very expensive <laughs> and not particularly practical unless you're going to the track, and I just wouldn't want to have to work on it. Yeah, it's a. I remember you said that you put a. Uh, I think you you had a long term bike in like 2010 or something, and you put an, yeah. uh, like a full exhaust system on it, and you're no, like, no, 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 I didn't. I only oh, put a slip on on because I didn't want to deal with the headers. Oh, that's and right. I, that's right. I made the mistake. I put a Bizaz uh, fuel controller on it, and man, like taking the tank off and then connecting to the to the injectors and all the connectors and sensors under the tank on a V4 engine it was such a pain in the ass. It took all day. <laughs> yeah, you know, sometimes complexity is rewarding, but also. Um, complex you might say <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i think i think there's a general note there about the popularity of naked sport bikes and just having to take the fairings off every time you want to yeah. do any maintenance on a sport bike you know absolutely yep yeah i'm, yeah, I'm staring down the barrel at taking all the bodywork off of a ycf r6 tomorrow for the shop manual filming and i told spencer i'm like this is the part i'm looking forward to the least is how long <laughs> it's going to take and he's like yeah i'll go get lunch while you're doing that <laughs> right right all the like fiddly plastic fasteners yes. and all that Even, stuff you want to try really hard not to damage. I, yeah. I know I had an I had an older VFR for a while, and even just that, which you don't think of as like a horribly complicated fared bike, but like just yep. getting all the stuff to line up on the bottom, like you're laying on the garage floor and you're trying to like line <laughs> up the little. It wasn't, and it was every time you changed the oil. It was wasn't yep. worth it. Wasn't worth, worth it. it. Yeah. So so. Uh, do you think, um, Ari, would you, do you think it's fair to classify it as sort of like, because uh, obviously the recommendation has been thus far to do research, read the manual, try to understand what you're doing before you do it. So is it is a, a, a good rule of thumb probably uh, to, if you read the manual and you don't understand what they're talking about or what you're, you know, at, at that point, obviously you take it to a shop, but like, where, where do you think a good line is to draw for like, you know, boosting someone's confidence who might be um, lacking confidence or, or tamping someone down who thinks they can do anything? Yeah, I guess that's a, a really that's a great question, and frankly, it's a really tough one for me to answer because I only really have my own perspective, which right. is which is like you know the only reason I would not do it is because I don't have the time or the equipment, or buying the equipment is too expensive. Like I don't rebuild shocks, I don't cut my own valve seats because like I don't have the stuff to do it. It's easier to take it to someone else to do. Um, but yeah, in terms of someone who's kind of a, a a newer mechanic trying to determine where to draw the line. Maybe it's other factors, like how, how soon do you need the bike fix? Like, can you afford to have it in the garage on a stand for two weeks instead of a weekend, if that's what it takes? Or yeah. do you have the money, if necessary, to try and do it yourself and then take it to a shop? 
Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm sorry. I can't really think of like a, a hard and fast rule. If you've read the manual through the procedure and you just can't wrap your head around it and you've tried to watch YouTube videos and you can't wrap your head around it, then obviously it's not smart to dive into. Nothing's going to make more sense once you have an engine apart or, <laughs> or components in front of you. So if, but at the same time, you have to be wary. If you've read it and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I totally have this. Just like, just make sure. Do you have all the tools? Do you have the right. measuring equipment you're going to need? Because I think a lot of people also run into mistakes when they see that they need something or that there is a process that needs to be done, like checking the tolerance on uh, whatever, let's say valve clearances. And they're like, oh, well, I don't have, I have some feeler gauges. I don't have a full set, but like, this will be fine. And like, no, right. you need, you need the actual stuff. <laughs> you, know, you need to have the tools. And there's certainly a lot of ways that you can MacGyver around Right. using the factory tool which is one of the reasons i'm a fan of like climber and haynes is because they're not aimed at factory mechanics they'll like tell you how to fabricate the tool yourself yeah yeah but there's definitely situations where like this will probably be all this will probably be all right is not something you want to be <laughs> saying or thinking as you're moving through a process yeah so i, I think I'll, I'll i'll jump in and i think that for me and it this is going to depend on the kind of bike it is, but I think for me, my my final step has always been like the shim under or shim over bucket valves where there's camshafts on top that have to come off. Um, that's just been my personal uh, take it to the shop at that point. And the example that I'll use is when I owned a uh, a 2000 and <clears throat> excuse me 2015 Tiger 800 XC, and I had pretty much done everything on that bike. I mean, that bike had been at one point everything was down to the frame with the engine in it. Um, and the only thing that I didn't do on that bike was was adjust the valves. And I remember talking to Joe Zito, who had a Tiger 800 and still does. And he was like, yeah, I was I did it myself. And it took me two days. And Joe oh is a God. very good mechanic. Yeah, and like, is, even yeah. for someone like him to like get everything apart and to do all the little... Because um, for that, you needed a special tool for one part of the job. And I was like, no. That, like For me, I paid $800 to have it done. And that was worth not being in the garage for, for two days straight. Yeah. And there hits a point where like, it, there hits a point for me anyway, where it's not fun anymore. I like mm. I like the learning, I like the taking apart, I like the figuring out how to put it back together. Um, throughout, throughout time, I've been much better about taking things apart than I have putting them back together. Um, oh, I yeah. took my, always, always the easier procedure yeah. there. My, my, my parents will tell you the story. I was a kid once and my dad was an early adapter to computers and he came home the one day and I had disassembled his computer. Oh my God. I was like five and I didn't know any better. And <laughs> it was, I, and I couldn't figure out how to put it back together. So that was one where I got punished for that. But yeah, I, I think yep. that for me, the, the valve check aspect, I, I can check the valves. I have no problem taking it apart to check the valves. Um, but when it comes time to like taking the cams off and then putting all the timing back together, that's a bit much well, for me. Well, and, it's a, and that's fair. I think that's a common, a common line that people yep. don't want to cross because that is difficult. And if you screw it up, it can be really bad. And also even with, even if you don't screw it up in order to have the right equipment to do it, the shims, you, you've got the option of either measuring the ones that you have and then going to the dealership and hopefully being able to trade them or buy them or buying a whole kit. And those are also fairly substantial investments in time and money. So yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's, nice to leave it to a shop because they've got all the stuff there to do it. It's, um, it's, uh, it does. So well, I think you said this Spurge, but it depends so much on the bike too. Right. Yep. Like I definitely like my, I have a, um, you know, mid two thousands, um, KTM 950 Supermoto, which is a like big thousand CC liquid cooled V twin, um, relatively simple. It's carbureted and everything, but, um, but yeah, when it came time to do a full, whatever it was like 10,000 mile, 12,000 kilometer service on it, I did the same thing. It was like, cost me 800 bucks or something like that to have it all done at the shop. But I was just like, I, I'm not going to dive into that. On the other hand, um, I grew up around air cool, um, sorry, airhead BMWs, uh, air cool BMWs. And I don't know how much time you guys have spent working on those bikes, but if, if I was using that as a barometer of how hard it is to check valves, like I would have thought I can plug. work on anything. It's unbelievable yeah, it's so because easy. there's the only two of them. They got screw yeah. adjustments. They're right out there in the open. Yeah, you don't so have simple. to take off the tank. The engines just stick out the side of the engine. Yeah. You just pop the valve cover off. It's push rods. It's so simple. There's only yep. two valves. It's just like it's like it's like Legos for valve adjustments. It's so so basic. Yeah, but those, and those were like those are like a screw adjuster, correct? Screw adjusters. Yeah, yep, which, correct. Which aren't particularly common anymore, but you'll still see them. Like you know, if you've got an XT two twenty five checking the valves, you can do that in an hour, and you can adjust them in an hour. But if you've got like I said, a YZF R six. Totally different story. It's going to take you two hours just to get the bodywork on and off. Yeah, and that's so it that's is very actually, bike dependent. Yeah, that's actually a good point too, right? Like you 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 have a, a 600 cc BMW from the 60s, um, which has four total valves, and then you have a 600 cc Yamaha from 2010 that has 16 total valves. So that 
there's a in, huge in different delta there. Exactly. Because, yeah, yeah. Totally, I mean, totally different architecture, completely different. But even if you just consider how many valves there are total, yep. it's like gives you an idea of how complicated one bike is versus how simple the other one is. The, the Z125 um, and the Grom still have screw type and it's air cooled and there's only two valves. So those are very simple to check. And and those are horizontal engines too, basically. They just right like out stick out. So Not yeah, a, a lot deal. easier to do. I, well, I know when I know when Lance was buying his VFR, he has one of the ones with the VTEC on it. And he was like literally like looking up how much it was going to cost him to get the valve <laughs> service before he bought the bike. He was like, well, I'm not doing it myself. So I'm going to figure out how man. much this is going to cost me ahead of time. Absolutely. Yeah. That's smart. Super, super smart. Well, when you guys alluded to it, um, and I don't know if this is the I don't know if this is the official segue into um, the section we have about misconceptions, um, but I would just like to take a moment to say uh, that tools are a huge part of this because one of the reasons, for example, that it was so easy for me to learn how to adjust valves on an Airhead BMW is that they're easy to work on. But the other thing was that my dad had everything. I mean, you only need like three wrenches to do that anyway, but the point <laughs> he, he had feeler gauges and he had everything set up and it was all ready. Like I just, it's so much easier to do the thing when you have the tools you need to get the job done. And, and that's like, I think that can be underestimated vastly. Well, I think, I think what's important there, bless, bless you, you. Um, is that if you don't know what tools you need, if you're in a shop where all the tools are there, it makes it a lot easier because otherwise you're going through and you're yeah. trying to figure out what tools you need. And if you don't know, then it's really a guessing game. But like you said, you had access to your dad's toolbox where if he had everything there, it makes it yep. a lot easier to experiment on trying things. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. I mean, this is why I like working on stuff at Aries shop instead of mine. Because <laughs> he's got a bike lift and a bunch of tools that I don't have. Well, not to plug TSM again or anything, but I'm yeah, going to. No. We do have an episode on how to build a comprehensive DIY toolkit for under 500 bucks. So that's on YouTube and it's been vetted numerous times now and there's some great yeah. there's some great pictures of you in there when you used to haul your toolbox down two flights of stairs from your apartment correct yep. yeah sucks, that's actually man. yeah that that's a good point that episode is um valuable in the sense that it has information on how to build that uh diy toolkit at your house but also some more anecdotes about how you got started airy which i think is um i hope for other people inspiring yeah, appreciate so, that. But yeah, I would yeah. certainly ch recommend checking that out because it's not a lot of money. And we also explain how investing in that toolkit is a good value because it pays for itself pretty quickly. Yeah, I know. I actually, I asked that question to you earlier about like, you know, what's the biggest delta between something someone could do at home and get charged for a lot at the at, at a garage or at, by a mechanic? And you had a good answer, which is sort of basic stuff. And I think you actually do some calculations in an episode, right? To talk yeah. about how long it would take in oil changes or whatever to pay for this toolkit. And it's exactly. really not that many. It's, it's not remarkable. very many. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, well, yeah, so I, I, think, um, I think we might as well just jump right into sort of common misconceptions about um, DIYs. I know I already snaked your... Um, I got a, I got a backup. We're good. Do you? Okay. Don't well, you why don't you take it? That. You take you take it away then, Spurs. So yeah. So this is this is going to be uh, miscon misconceptions, right? So things that are actually probably a little bit easier to work on than you might realize. Now, the one that I'm going to say is bike dependent because if you're trying to pull the clutch out of a mid 2000s R 1200 GS, you're going to be screwed. Um, but I think I think replacing <laughs> a clutch um, is actually a lot easier than people might think it is. And the example that I'll use is I was on a three-day um, adventure event uh, in deep sand and I blew the clutch out on my Tiger 800. And um, I found out that I could replace the clutch in about 45 minutes. Uh, but the, the longest part is probably scraping the gasket off if you don't have the appropriate gasket scraper. Um, <laughs> but depending on the configuration of your engine, uh, replacing clutch plates is actually a pretty easy job that I think a lot of people out there could handle. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. And also, as you said, extremely bike dependent. For a lot of modern bikes, the clutch just sort of is on the outside of the case, and it's one of the last things that gets put on. And the reason that Spurge made that joke about a mid two thousands BMW is that um, before twenty thirteen, all BMW Boxer twins had uh, a single dry, a uh, single plate dry clutch that was on the back of the engine, about the back of the. Yeah, the back of the engine basically and it was essentially the first thing that rolled down the assembly line so if you had to get to the clutch it meant <laughs> just, just last absolutely ripping the bike apart it was basically um, you basically have yeah. to like take the bike in half right the entire back of the bike <laughs> has to come off yeah yeah the old one you have just split the transmission from the from the engine anyway um yeah it, it's uh i think i think clutch is a good one um would you agree Ari? uh yeah i hadn't even thought of that one that was a little bit beyond and and i don't know if you did this out in the the field spurgeon but you could also just lay the bike on its side as opposed to draining the oil yeah right, right. yep i I'm did I, I did not do that i ended up i ended up i was able to finish the event and i ended up doing it in my garage uh, um but doing it in my garage i was like oh if i had to do this out in out in the field i would be able to do it 
Yeah. yeah you I have to have a clutch pack with you out in the field. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be carrying plates, which would be a little weird. But um, but yeah, I honestly Spurgeon, I was I was I was going to make it a, a joke about the the um the gruff Spurgeon Dunbar character, and I think that I would never expect Spurgeon Dunbar to drain the oil to change his clutch. I would assume he would just lay any bike, even if you're at your garage, lay it on its side and just do it. Drink that's it. How you... Just drink that oil down, baby. And just, <laughs> exactly. no, I, I, I will say that like, I am usually the person and, and this is, I'm the person that if I show up for some of these adventure events, I keep a Tupperware container for each of my bikes. And I actually have a Tupperware container in my garage of spare parts that are regularly needed. So, you know, you make the joke about, you have to have a clutch pack with you. I'm usually the person that if, cause in our group of friends, like 90% of us all have KTMs for that reason is that we can share parts back and forth if something goes wrong. Right. Yeah. Um, but I'm usually the person in the back of my truck where I have the, I bring the Tupperware container for whatever bike I, I'm taking to the event for that. So if you've seen me at an event and you need a spare part, just just meet me in my truck and I can probably help you out. <laughs> You're only as good as your spares is the old race saying. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, um, so what about you, Eric? You have, do, you, do you have something in the chamber for something you think is a little easier than people might expect? I actually, I want to I wanna invert that. And something that I feel is harder than people expect, and ah. not to not to, to yeah. contradict what you mentioned earlier, but tire changes. If you have tubeless tires, they can be a royal pain in the ass to change. It depends. Similar mm -hmm. to the valve clearance situation, it really depends on the type of tire. Um, if you've got sport touring rubber on your bike and you're trying to do it at home with tire irons, it's probably going to suck. It's going to be very very difficult. Whereas if you're on a sport bike and you've got Q3s or Pirelli Super Courses, like those are buttery soft tires, really easy. But sport touring tires are stiffer. Um, yep. It's one of those situations where I think it's important to know how to do. But it's definitely a scenario where if you've got a local shop or someone with a tire changer that'll do it for twenty five or thirty bucks, if you bring them the wheels, undeniably a good value. Oh, yeah. So because I sweating it sweating absolutely. it by hand. You're gonna you're gonna scratch your rims. You're gonna bust the knuckle. It's gonna take way longer than it needs to. I a hundred percent agree. My only point that I was trying to make earlier is knowing how to repair it. So I no, do no, not, no, I, no, no, no. I agree with that. Okay. Zach had suggested that doing your own tires. Gotcha. If you've got tube type yep. tires, like on your dual sports, of course, do those at home. They're a lot easier, but some tube type tires or sorry, tubeless tires are so robust yep. that even just getting the tire to come off the, the bead is just like a Herculean effort. If oh, I, I think equipment. I think yeah. that is something that is very much I would I would highly say take it to the shop and have your tires swapped if you have a place locally um, that'll do it for like twenty or thirty bucks because it is yep. a miserably uh, knuckle busting yep. experience and uh, something you know even if you're confident with tire irons you're like oh I can spoon those off and it won't be a big deal like getting it to seat back if you don't have compressed air for example exactly. like you can use Good a bike point. pump to to adjust your tire pressure and put air in there but you can't use a bike pump to get a seed uh, to get a bead to seat back onto a five inch rim on your sport bike or whatever yeah, it's just well, it's it's similar similar to using an impact gun to get the the damper rod bolt off the bottom of your fork spurgeon like, yes if you had that you could have zapped it and it comes out fine because it's got speed and impact yeah, same yep. thing with an air compressor like you're simply not going to be able to put enough air into a tire by hand to overcome what's leaking out from the unseated bead so yep. just so if you're in the audience and you're listening to this and you're a little bit confused what i was re recommending earlier is learning how to repair a tire so if you have a tubeless tire learning how to use a plug kit um, and I believe there's a shop manual episode on that, or is there an article on that? Both. Both. Okay. Yeah. So because just being able to knowing, you know, know how to repair the tire to get down the road, whether, and then if you have a tube type tire, obviously pulling the tire off and, and inflating the, the tube or fixing the tube is a, is a much bigger project. But again, learning how to do that ahead of time is a lot easier than doing it down the road. But to Aries point, if you're just going in for your regular tire change, I recommend um, if you can take the tire, take the wheels off. That's usually a little bit cheaper. So like jack your bike up and take the wheels off and then take it to your, your local shop. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, that's, I, I when I, um, uh, in my, in my, <laughs> my younger formative years, um, when I didn't have a, a garage, uh, a place to work on bikes really. And I wasn't confident. I absolutely, uh, took the advice that, that, um, that Arian Spurge are slinging right now, which is to take it to, a, I found a local guy who had a tire changer in his garage and he would do it for 20 bucks. And it was just like, I couldn't believe how, how ready I was to part with $40. To was that, that, was that, was that a change. young Ari Henning? Did you just like take it? It was not, but it was <laughs> no, that was in San Francisco, right? Yeah. That was when I lived in San Francisco and he was just down, he was just in the same neighborhood as I was. It was close. Uh, it was pretty easy. Uh, yeah. So, yep. um, well, I did, 
I do. I have a tire changer, and I've certainly received a lot of inquiries from people who are like, "Where should I go to get my tires changed?" And I'm like, "Where are you?" And they're like, "I'm in Torrance." And I'm like, "Just come by." <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's it's um this is interesting. Uh, one of the things that it, that I was going to recommend it's it's not so much an easy job, but it's a modification that I've done on a couple bikes that I absolutely love. Um, but I'm glad you guys brought up changing tires because um do you remember uh, that long term R1 I had, Ari, where I put the little mm. 90 degree valve stem on? Yep. Yep. Um, and I absolutely love that upgrade. I think 90 degree valve stems, um, are excellent. And to they be, should all be 90 degrees. They should Why all be 90 degrees. Yes. And to be clear, uh, what we're, we're talking about, right. Is the, 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 uh, the valve stem that comes off the inside of the rim on your tire where you, um, add or remove air from your tires. Um, and they are often, uh, sort of in a classic sense, they stick straight up. So they stick up toward the center of the hub, but, uh, nicer bikes or nicer wheels will have a 90 degree one that point out. And that's especially helpful when their brake rotors are large and, uh, and you're trying to check tire pressure 250 degrees. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> which was the case with that R1 that I had. Um, but yeah, um, if you, if you can get tires off, um, whether you're paying someone 20 bucks a wheel to do it or you're doing it yourself. Um, I love that upgrade and I love that, that, uh, that piece of technology. It's not even technology, but just like adding that to a bike to me is makes, it makes it so much better and it's so easy to do. And they are so cheap, um, that I would definitely recommend doing that. If you feel like you've gotten to the point where taking tires off and putting them on, on tubeless rims. Is, is easy, that, but. is that your misconception pick or is that something you were just throwing out as a PSA? I don't remember what, where am I again? What time is it? I don't know what's happening. I don't know. Do you have a misconception pick? I know you talked about the brake pads earlier, but is there another one that you wanted to throw out there? Um, well, I guess I kind of used it up when we led into this conversation when I was talking about tools, because I feel like that's something that I just wanted to be. I'm not sure. I, I guess I don't have a, a, um, a super um, rigid misconception in my head, but I do think that like having the right tools is something that I've even done that. I've even like read through and thought what I need to do and thought, Oh yeah, that, that'll be super easy. And I can imagine it being easy. And then it's just like, I literally don't have one socket size and then you're boned and you can't do yep. the, the job. Yep. So knowing what you need ahead of time. And, and it was something my dad taught me and he was an auto mechanic. So it was easy for him to say, but to never hesitate to buy tools. And yeah, I still don't. I just buy <laughs> stuff if I need it because I know I'm going to use it or someone else is going to need it. And you know, I like to be independent and self-sufficient. Um, there, I do draw a line with certain, you know, expenditures on very specialized pieces of equipment. But if you, you know, if you don't have a complete set of wrenches or a good set of JS screwdrivers or a good torque wrench, just don't hesitate to buy it if you have the cash because it will pay for itself pretty quickly. I think yeah. it's a, we we were having a conversation the other day about uh, Motion Pro tools, and one of the things that came up was they have a, a set of bearing pullers. And for many times, I, I've just used the old hammer and a screwdriver technique. And I remember the first time <laughs> that I saw that Motion Pro had a bearing puller, and I was like, "Oh, I'm buying that." I wasn't even gonna. I I didn't have a bearing job in sight that I was gonna <laughs> do, but I was like, I was so enamored by how cool this tool was, and there was an actual right tool to do the job. I'm like, "Oh, put that in my shopping cart." So, I have fallen yeah, victim yeah. to that exact thing on the web on the Motion Pro website many times, where I'm like, yeah. I need that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I guys, I am enjoying this conversation, but I will say that I forgot to bring my laptop charger, and I'm at 11. percent So, Ooh. well, luckily for that, you, it's time to kick you off the show. Exactly. Anyway. <laughs> I, I did. I did want to bring. Uh, I did want to bring it back around because I. Um, there was a, not to bring up a blunder of yours, Ari, but I. But I. I, I wanted to bring it up because I think it's a good anecdote. Um, do you, um, you remember, I think it was when you were specking out those, um, CBR or CB 300 engines, um, to do the break-in challenge to see if it was going to like, if you go wide open on break-in, oh, the freaking paper you, towel and you left a paper towel in the valve oh train, God. I believe, didn't you? Yeah. I had, we were doing engine swaps cause we're doing like back-to-back -back testing. And when I took the engine out of the bike to, <laughs> to protect it, I stuffed paper towels in the intake and exhaust ports. And then I put the engine back, which in is the bike, which is you, common you by the way, see, but you didn't say. see it. You didn't see it. Like when you were connecting everything back together, you didn't see him. Nope. And like the bike started and ran and then just like choked out. And I'm like, what the F? And eventually I think I took the spark plug out and like looked in there and could see like blue paper towel everywhere. And I was like, oh my God. So I had to take the engine out, <laughs> take the head off, clean everything, and then put it back together and back in the bike. But no permanent, a, no permanent damage though. No, 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 no permanent okay. damage, but just one of those things. And that's one of those situations where eventually you see yep. it and obviously you can get upset about it, but at some point you just have to like swallow your anger and be like, okay, this is what I have to do now. <laughs> Yeah, and that's a, that's incredibly difficult to do, and I remember being so impressed when you because I remember when you told Spencer and I that that had happened, we were both like, "Oh my god, I can't believe you just did all of that!" And then it just sucked a paper towel in, and you have to do everything again. And you were like, "Yeah, well, at least I know how the job goes. At least I know what to do. At least yeah. I know how it works." Well, it's, we it's, were just like, "Oh, 
<laughs> that stems stems from an anecdote that my dad has when he was racing at Daytona one year and he spun a bearing on his crankshaft mm-hmm. and went to a junkyard, found an engine, rebuilt his CB450 engine in a hotel room and then went back and won the race the next day. And there's that's like a that's a legendary awesome. story in my household and there's there's pictures of it. They like pushed the beds on their sides up against the wall and they were up all night with paper towels and newspaper on the ground. And but luckily, luckily ex- for him, he didn't leave his paper towels in his engine. <laughs> yeah. I had my own experience where I raced um, one of my dad's vintage bikes in Belgium a number of years ago, and I blew the bike up in qualifying. And I was ready to just tuck tail and be like, let's go get drunk at the Chimay tent. Like, what are we going to do? <laughs> but Dave Smith, who was one of my dad's mechanics, was like, we're not done here. And we went, we went to the um, swap meet. We found an engine, we swapped the engine, and I was able to race that day. So yeah, it, was, awesome. it was an interesting, interesting mirrored experience where it's like, sometimes you just got to like, what's the path forward here? What do we have yeah. to do? How do we make this work? That's that's definitely one of the things I've I've learned from you most, I think, and you've helped me with most over the years is perseverance. Is just being like, got to just figure out the next thing. Like, don't give there's, up. Just There's a solution somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> right on, man. Well, um, I have had a lot of fun yeah. um, chewing over old stories and getting your insight on, you know, DIY versus mechanic stuff. So I definitely appreciate you coming to hang out. Spurge, any final words? Thank you, Mr. Henning. This was a, this was a fun podcast and uh, <laughs> hopefully the audience will enjoy all yeah. of our blunders as much as we have. Well, right on. I appreciate you guys having me. It was a lot of fun and I'm going to sign off before my battery does it for me. So <laughs> see you guys later. Bye. See you, man. So I am glad that Ari was our guest on this episode because he held you yeah. accountable. You weren't going to share with us a story about the time you set a Ducati on fire. I was, you know, that, I guess maybe I'd blacked it out or something. I don't know. Yeah, that was, that was actually a, that whole trip was, a um, that was scramblers in the Rockies. Um, our, uh, an episode of, uh, motorcycle shenanigans that Ari and I made years ago. Um, that is uh, still on the YouTubes somewhere for your viewing pleasure if you're interested. Um, but yeah, I, I was a walking disaster. That was that that whole trip was like an Airy Henning MacGyver routine because I also well I lit the bike on fire, which actually in the end wasn't that big a deal. It was it ended up being fine. We you know put out the fire. We made sure the wires were okay and it was all good. But the main thing I did was I broke the key, so it had a laser cut key, and we couldn't get a little um, fastener off. And I was like, I was looking around for a wrench or I was too lazy or whatever. Um, and I was like, I'll just use the key. I'll just use the tip of the key to pop this little Zeus fastener out or whatever it was. Um, and I busted the tip of the key and then it wouldn't start the bike. And we were like, you know, two days into three days of filming or something. And I was like, oh my God. And like, we were just like, we're boned. We're in, and there was no, we're in, there was no spare key. They only had given no one spare key. key. We're in Colorado. We don't have any, like we're, we're, we're scrooged. Um, and, uh, yeah, and it was his. Yeah, I was riding the Triumph, and he was riding the Ducati. So it was his bike that I just disabled because I was being a twit. Um, <laughs> well, there's your, we there's your to, final do-it-yourself lesson for the audience out there. Uh, do not use your key as a screwdriver. Do no matter how not. much you want to. And so. in, to Ari Henning's credit, he hot wired that Ducati Scrambler, and, um, and it was also a proximity laser cut key. So the key not only had to be in the ignition with the ignition turned, which you can trick via the wiring, but the key has to be near the ignition. If it's not, then the chip tells the bike not to start. So we had to like tape the key to the ignition and then hot wire it. Uh, yeah, he no he wonder a no wonder magic. Ducati doesn't like lending you motorcycles. You you, <laughs> you break keys off, set them on fire, and return Brr. them with them wired up hot. So, I well, I, the, I, my one contribution I'll say to that trip was that we had to change tires and we realized at some point that we did not have any stands and it was my idea to use, um, tie downs, uh, from the motorcycle up to the balcony of the motel to dangle the bike in the air so that we could change the wheels and it ended up working. So I, I, that was my, my one heroic feat or idea, I suppose. Anyway, anyway, so let's go on to, we could probably, I was actually about to start telling a story about tying a, a bike to the rafters to, uh, change steering head bearings, but we'll save that for another podcast. <laughs> That's altogether. its own podcast, Spurgeon. High side, low side questions. So this is the portion of the podcast where Zach and I, we read your questions that you have sent into high High side, low side at revzilla.com. Um, we also source them from YouTube as well as from sometimes the uh, the Apple iTunes reviews. So if you don't get a T-shirt, sometimes we just uh, give you a mention. And this is actually going to be the first uh, one that I want to throw out here is um, from. Well, don't, uh, are you going to hang on? Hang on. Are you going to do the? Um, you, you're going to do Pietro's comment. We should. Some, we should mention that. That was what I was doing right now. Okay, all right, just making sure. I was, I was transitioning into to where I said we might pull your comment on uh, okay. Apple okay, iTunes, okay, just... but not for a T-shirt. And then I was going to say, this is actually going to be the second T-shirt we're giving away. Uh, I'm I'm breaking all the rules, and I'm giving a T-shirt to. Did you say Pietro? Is that how you pronounce it? 
I think so. Pietro? What, what, yeah, that's what it looks like to me. So if you so, remember back yeah. to the episode of High Side, Low Side, where we had, uh, I believe Joe Zeter was our guest on that one, and we were talking about our fantasy trips that we wanted to take. I wanted to go to the Alps. Um, thank you to all of you out there that gave me jumping off city recommendations for the Alps. <laughs> but I had talked about the fact that I wanted to do it on a Ducati Supersport SS from the 90s, and Pietro wrote in with a picture of him as a child on a yellow Ducati Supersport SS in the Alps. So unbelievable. Um, just uh, so, it was just so, can, such a small world, cool moment. So there's the <laughs> picture of uh, a Pietro on his Ducati. If you're looking at this on YouTube, there's a picture of him that he's sent in. And Pietro, if you're reading this, uh, we're going to hook back up with you. We're going to make sure you get a free high side, low side t-shirt. Even if you're living in Europe, we'll figure out a way to send it to you. We'll figure something out there for you. But thank you so much for sharing that picture with us. Yeah, so really, that was a cool story, um, and it was rad that you sort of you said that, and he was like, "Hey, you mean this bike? Here's a picture of me." Um, and he also gave you a, um, I think he also gave you a suggestion for a jumping off point. Yeah. Uh, but so I, yeah, I, that, it just it makes you rad. realize like there's people around the world that are listening to us talk about motorcycles, and damn it, that's cool. Oh, I'm gonna get choked up. Oh. Here. We got to move on. Um, the uh, next thing we wanted to next comment we wanted to mention is from Chris via email. Um, uh, has a pretty good question here. Chris says, I am a new rider and my only friend who rides has been doing so his whole life. I find I don't enjoy riding with him because he doesn't adjust his style to my very basic skill level. Do you have any tips of how to improve as a new rider who didn't grow up around motorcycles? And do you have any tips for planning solo adventures? Well, this... This might make me choke up a little bit too. Chris has got a riding buddy and his riding buddy's not like slowing down and going Chris's speed. And that is... Um, that's a bummer. So there's a couple things here. Um, I, I Chris asked, do you have any tips for how to improve as a new rider? That's a that's its own podcast, you might say. Yeah. Um, I don't know how we can really address that quickly. We, we kind of can't, except to just keep riding. Oops, excuse me. Except keep riding, Chris. You're, you're doing the right thing. Um, and do we have any tips for solo adventures? Yeah, sure. But what I want to address here is your friend should slow down. Yeah. Am I right, Spurge? I so that's that's my big takeaway. And and Chris, we do want to answer your questions. And maybe that is something that we pull up for a separate podcast is planning solo yeah, adventures yeah. and improving as a new rider. But if you're out there and you have an opportunity to be a mentor for somebody that wants to get into motorcycling, just take it easy and realize that they're probably scared less. Because yeah, you at one point were scared less too. And exactly. the, the big thing that drives me, you know, this, another point that ties in with this is that when someone says, Hey, can you take me for a ride on a motorcycle? Take them for a nice, slow ride on your motorcycle so that they get <laughs> excited about it. Do not go out there and pop a wheelie to show them how cool you are while they fall yeah. off the back because you didn't prepare them. Like, yeah. give people a, an enjoyable entry experience into this. And if you're going to ride with somebody on another bike, don't assume they're as fast as you are. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good, you know, the passenger... Um, uh, Riding, riding someone as a passenger for the first time on a motorcycle, that's definitely good advice. Go nice and slow. It's going to feel fast to them. Don't do anything weird. Um, but yeah, mostly Chris's question is, you know, it, it's too bad that his friend doesn't slow down. So a couple things. One, if you're a rider, as Spurge said, and you're starting with someone new, slow down. Go their speed. That It's going to be more enjoyable for them. And you, you owe it to the motorcycling community to be a good apple and take them um, along the road at their speed. If you are in Chris's situation and you're riding with people or someone who's riding too quickly for you, you should, this is difficult to do and it's not, uh, yeah, I, I know it's hard, but say something, just say like, Hey, I, I can't yeah. ride that fast. Like, I don't want to go that fast. I'm not comfortable with that. Um, and you should not feel pressure to go that fast. Don't go into corners faster than you are comfortable with because your friend is doing that. Absolutely do not do that. Um, and, and yeah, so that's, that's our advice to Chris. I would say anything else you want to add to Just, you know, I, I think it was a, it was an old Peter Egan article that you know, he, he was the first one that I remember referencing to ride your own bike. If your buddy's going too fast, he'll wait for you at a stop sign. Don't try and keep up with somebody that's faster than you. Take your time and, and ride at a pace that you feel comfortable with because this is yeah. supposed to be fun. It's not supposed to be terrifying. So hopefully, Chris, you can have that conversation with your friend. I hope that, um, you know, solo adventures are great. Um, there's lots of, uh, lots of fun to be had on motorcycles by yourself, but, but if you're afraid um, to have riding... that conversation with your friend, Zach and I are doing it for you. If you're oh, Chris's yeah. friend, slow great. down. Jesus. <laughs> or better yet, Chris, shoot us another email, high side, low side, com. Give us your friend's email. We will have that conversation for you. 100%. We will, we'll we say, will call listen. them out. <laughs> give, give us their okay. home address, their first name, last name, social security um, number, and we will cause some <laughs> havoc for that person in your life. 
Yeah, exactly. So, All right, so next, the second comment, the next, the next comment, uh, I just like to say, I'm going to take a quick nap because it has something to do with KTM suspension and I don't know what I'm just going to no, this right has to do with the Tenere surgeon. 700 as well. And you rode that bike. Did you not? Oh, Come that's, on. That's true. I did. I did. I love a T7. So I will keep it brief, but I wanted to throw out there. So NTG rocking, um, wrote in and he actually, uh, he or she, I believe it's a, he, uh, Nick. Yeah. Nick from Greece wrote in and he actually sent me a, a private message on Instagram as well. Um, but he said, just finished no watching the review of the Tenere 700. Um, I, I had done a review. Zach had done a daily rider on it. Um, and then he had also read an article where I took a 790 adventure R and I built it out to, to rally spec. And, and really the question that I want to focus on here is, you know, after all this time that I've had riding that bike and then riding the Tenere 700, if I could do it again, would I take a Tenere 700 and invest, you know, three or four thousand dollars, or would I just stick with a 790? Um, I would just stick with a 790. So I, I you know would. That I, what? I would. I, but I, you love honestly, that T7 engine. I, I like the Tenere 700 engine. I don't think that for the money you could put into a Tenere 700, I still don't think it would be as good and as balanced as a 790 off road. Mm. Um, and, and I don't think that you're going to be able to get the electronics package that the 790 has. What I learned. And, and this actually took me going out again with my buddy Jeff, where he was like, well, I'm going to leave the traction control on a little bit because I was just turning it off. And the traction control set on like one or two uh, on the 790 because you can like pick nine different scales yeah, was yeah. amazing. I mean, you could rail on the bike and it just held a line off road. And I think that for a lot of people that have never ridden off road, the weight, the balance, and then the aspect of that additional electronics, I think it, it makes that bike a winner. Yeah, fair enough. Plus, you love how easy it is to change the air filter. Dude, <laughs> until until you've spent three hours taking a Tiger, you know, eight hundred apart to change the air filter on it, you have no idea how easy it is to change an air filter on either a uh, a, a seven ninety Adventure R or the new nine hundred um, Tiger nine hundred. And, and you yeah. actually you're testing a Tiger eight fifty right now. You should pull the seat off and see if the air filters are underneath the seat the way it is on the nine hundreds. I I normally I would, but that's the kind of thing I would take to a mechanic. I think. I'm not really comfortable doing it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, in fairness, we're laughing. If you have an old previous generation Tiger 800 or like a, any of these big adventure bikes, chances are you would take it to the mechanic to have the air filter yeah. changed because it's not worth the three hour headache of pulling the gas tank off yourself. Yeah, seriously. No, I, my, my, my personal KTM 950 from 2006, it's a, you know, sort of like, oh, I clean the air cleaner or air filter. It's like, that's not so bad. Well, it's above the carburetors, which are under the gas tank. And to take the gas tank off, you have to take the, the crossing hose off the bottom of the gas tank. And in order to get the crossing hose hose off, sometimes you have to disconnect the radiator mounts. And if you have to disconnect the radiator mounts that much, you have to drain the coolant and holy crap, now we're 10 steps into a two-step process. I'll have to see if I I had, I had a picture where, um, I was going up to Canada to race in this adventure rally. And it was the first time that I changed the air filter on the tiger. And I was like, I'll just do it the night before quickly. (laughs) <laughs> there's a picture of that bike in my garage i'll have to see if i can find it and put the have the producers put it up on the screen but it was like it looked like i was rebuilding the it looked like i was rebuilding the entire bike and all i was trying to do was change the air filter so um a lo- long story short ntg rocking um i would if i was to do it again and i was spending my own money i would go with a 790 adventure r even without the rally suspension on it um that would be the pick that's the bike that is probably gonna be next to my garage if i can ever save up enough pennies to uh to put it there yeah, just got to work a little harder, my friend. I'm trying. So I'm trying. So, so yeah, to Spurge's point, uh, please do reach out to us. If you're watching this on YouTube, please write a comment. We do check them. Um, if you're listening anywhere else in the podcast universe, send us an email to highsidelowside at revzilla.com. Um, and please um, take the time, if you have it, to write us a review on iTunes because that helps with distribution of the show, helps more people find it. And you could win a t-shirt just like Hachoo! Mr. or Mrs. Hachoo! Hachoo! <laughs> um, yeah, friendly reminder, H-D-F-V-Y-F-F. Did I catch a niner in that. there? What are you calling from a walkie-talkie? <laughs> yeah, oh. uh, you are You are the t-shirt winner. Thank you so much for your comment. Thank you for listening. Um, and yeah, I think we're, we're just about, uh, we're, I think we're out of stuff to say. We got nothing happens, more to but. say. For those of you <laughs> listening in the audience, thank you as always for joining Zach Quartz and myself on another episode of High Side, Low Side. Until next time. Hey, everybody. It's like my Al Borland salute. It's just... <laughs> Everybody, hey! next time. <laughs> <laughs>